This episode is brought to you by the Davenant Institute, which seeks to retrieve the riches of classical Protestantism to renew and build up the contemporary church. Key to this aim is their educational arm, Davenant Hall. Davenant Hall specializes in educating the interested layperson, pastors looking for a refresher, and more by focusing on the primary documents of the Reformation Church. No survey texts. Go right to the sources with an expert guide. Davenant Hall offers two programs, a certificate and a Master of Letters in Classical Protestantism, which is roughly equal to an MAR program at a seminary. In both, they will ground you in the theological, biblical, historical, philosophical, and linguistic foundations of the Protestant faith. There is almost nothing like this. Plus, Davenant Hall delivers these programs via digital technology to make high-quality theological education affordable through online courses. You will also have access to their Davenant's Common Room Discord server to keep up with the lecturers and your fellow classmates. Davenant Hall insists on in-person fellowship as key to Christian formation, hosting regular residentials at the Davenant House Study Center in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains in South Carolina. So, if you're looking for a new course of theological study, I urge you to consider enrolling at Davenant Hall this fall. Visit www.davenanthall.com to find out more. Lastly, GGG listeners who are first-time Davenant Hall students get a $25 discount on auditing any of their next term's courses with code GGG Trinity 24, which is in our show notes. Again, please visit www.davenanthall.com to enroll. Hey, this is Peter Bell, and I am in the beautiful wine country of Central Coast, California, in Santa Maria, north end of Santa Maria, in Santa Barbara County. I serve Redeemer OPC, Redeemer Orthodox Presbyterian Church, on the north end of Santa Maria. We meet at Temple Bethel, which is right there, Temple Bethel, at 11 a.m. for Sunday service and 9.45 a.m., so just before that for Sunday school. For all ages, we have kids Sunday school, adult Sunday school, or all Sunday school at 9.45. You can find us at discoverredeemer.org with one R, again, discoverredeemer.org. We have a bunch of activities throughout the week, but most importantly, Sunday, we have the gospel preach. The, the sacraments administered and church discipline faithfully brought out. So I hope to see you here at Redeemer OPC in Santa Maria, Central Coast, wine country of Santa Barbara. Hope to see you. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Danny Hyde from the Oceanside United Reformed Church. I want to invite you out to our church. We meet in sunny Southern California uh, here in San Diego and we meet at the Army Navy Academy in Carlsbad, right along the ocean, as you can see, the Pacific. And uh, we meet every Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning. We uh, hear the word of God, we hear the gospel preach. We have the Lord's Supper every Sunday morning. And then we have Sunday school at about noon for kids. We come again uh, together at five o'clock every night, uh, Sunday night for uh, teaching, prayer and singing. And then we also have various uh, midweek groups, Bible studies, men's, women's, and also other Bible studies as well uh, throughout the week. So. I want to invite you out to worship with us. If you know anybody in the area here in North County of San Diego, uh, invite them as well. Let them know. You can find out more about us on our website, OceansideURC.org, or also on all those various social media. You'll find us as well. God bless. Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. We're on a season seven episode. We're continuing on throughout all of scripture to find Jesus Christ through all of scripture. And that's what uh, all of scripture points to him. And today's episode is the books, Jeremiah and Lamentations. So two books and uh, we're picking up where Isaiah left off last week. And we're pretty much in the same timeline and context and all that stuff talking about uh, the fall of the kingdom of Judah. So in Jeremiah, just a little helpful tee up background for you guys to, to uh, get warmed up for this conversation. Uh, in Jeremiah, we hear uh, from another one of God's prophets through the latter years of the kingdom of Judah before and then during the uh, invasion of Babylon and then after the invasion going into exile. 
And then uh, Jeremiah began his calling as a prophet in the 13th year of King Josiah. And the late uh, and the last date in the book, we're seeing around the seventh year of Jeho- Jehoiachin's exile in Babylon, the, the sole uh, lone survivor of the Davidic line. Uh, so this is a probably about about a span of 66 years and written. Uh, the events are 600 years before Christ on earth. And then Lamentations also focused on the words from Jeremiah. We hear from uh, of laments in response to the exile in Babylon in Babylon in 587 BC. So we see Jesus as a weeping prophet who grieves over Jerusalem, just as Jeremiah did over the fallen city. And that's uh, you can find that cited in Lamentation, Lamentations 116. Um a little bit of background too on resources. Uh, you know, there is some commentaries out there. We kind of like pick certain things from um, and whatnot. There is the expository commentary by Crossway. Uh, this this volume here has uh, Jerry Huang did the Jeremiah section in it. Um, I used this same exact volume last week with Isaiah. I actually didn't have time to really use much of Jerry's commentary in this one, but for the audience, this is a good one. Um, I did cite New Testament res- uh, New Testament verses uh, through the uh, Family Worship Bible Guide (RHB). Uh, I just kind of put in my own notes for the three of us to look at. We may bring them up, we we may not. Um, there's the introduction to the Old Testament, Erdman's book uh, by Hubbard and Dearman uh, here. They go through every book in the Old Testament. And then uh, there is also uh, Erdman's has a couple, has a um, a commentary ser- series, uh, the new international commentary of the Old Testament. I did pull out the Lamentations and the Jeremiah ones. Um, they just kind of give it a little bit more of a background of these two books. Um, so... I don't know if you guys have other resources. Another a couple other ones I have. I, a short period of time, you know, studying for this one. I use the Bible Project. Um, it's it seems simple, but it's very helpful and useful. <clears throat> there are videos that you guys can find on YouTube, and they're just you know about ten minute episodes that kind of really, in a artistic way, show and talk through books of the Bible. Um, you guys are going to totally make fun of me, and and uh, rightfully so, but. Uh, I did get tired of reading, so I watched the Jeremiah movie by Patrick Dempsey. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to, that was just something to sit back and uh, kind of watch and just kind of. Is that like know. Kurt Cameron Inc.? No, no. Uh, yeah, he was not <laughs> anywhere in there. It's actually a decently made movie. So um, uh, take it for what it is. Um, obviously, uh, read the two books. Uh but uh, the Jeremiah is a long one. It's the longest of the prophetic books in the Old Testament. So um, we have a lot to talk about, you know. So in our show notes, we'll have some of our resources. We'll kind of point you to. Probably won't post the uh, the movie one that I mentioned, but uh, you guys' <laughs> yeah. books. Uh, and then uh, also, if you guys want to connect with us, there's an email address that we have on there. You can find us on social media. Find these uh, conversations on YouTube, that kind of thing. So uh, we have, if you guys have been listening to our show for or, a, a while, a few years now, uh, you may may or may not know Danny Hyde, Dr. Daniel Hyde is uh, our newest co-host, and he's really helpful uh, helping us walk through this season. So uh, we got a seasoned doctorate pastor, we got a new pastor as Peter, and then just me as your average everyday <laughs> Christian layman. So, uh, read how are you guys? A week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you go through all these <laughs> doing good, <laughs> doing good. This will be, this will be fun. Yeah. How are you? How are you guys doing? Hanging in there. Yep, Looking forward well. to our break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're recording this on December 6th and most people are going to be listening to this the end of March. <laughs> so we're actually taking all of January and February off. We do this every year, so we'll take a few months off and just batch recordings. So it's gonna be fun. Yeah, this is and, our last one, right? Until yeah, whenever. Our last one, yeah, mm-hmm. in December, and then yeah. we'll start recording again in March for uh 
season seven. So yeah. Yeah. This is the, the, uh, the heart, the end of the marathon before we get a little rest before another marathon, but got two and a half months off after this. It'll be fun. It'll be nice. Yeah, so, yeah definitely. Yep. Yeah. So, I don't know. Danny, what do you have any, you were looking at your bookcase when, when um, Nick was going through his, his I mean, there's uh, some books way up on top, but resources. I nothing like nothing hundred percent stands out. So that's, yeah. that's the same for me. I, I like, again, I'm going to, I'm going to go with old tried and true. I got John Calvin's commentary on Jeremiah oh, yeah. limitations. That's, that's the good stuff right there. If if you want solid exegesis with pretty good Christ centeredness, yeah. um, a really good contextualization, at least for for Calvin's time, I would uh, I'd point people towards that. And then maybe less so directly on this, but if people <laughs> look for books, we were talking before recording on like divine hiddenness of some sort, um, especially around the the Megalotes, which is the five scrolls. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that in this episode. Um, but there's some good books on that stuff. Chloe Sun has one. Um, we had her on about a oh, year yeah. ago to talk about this. And there's other stuff. So we'll we'll kind of walk through this. But it's unfortunate. There's not like that many great reformed Christ-centered commentaries on some of these larger books. There's some good like background stuff, but not great like Christ-centered stuff. As I say that, Danny is going to his... Uh, yeah, his, I was just gonna uh, mention bookcase. the only one that really, I guess, that somewhat stands out, which is, um, by John McKay. He's a he's a Scottish uh, yep. professor, um, Old Testament professor, John McKay, and this one yep. this one's on lamentation. So this is published by a Christian. It's like mentor is the imprint, but it's Christian focus. Yep. So yeah, lamentations. It's you know pretty good, pretty oh. helpful. I mean, it's not the most. It's not the book that people mostly you know, associate with reading their Bibles, but um, yeah. I'm pretty sure I've, I've taught through or preached through at some point. I don't know if I have audio, but mm-hmm. uh, for at least for Advent, I did it. I know one time. So, yeah. I wonder if it's because well, when I was going through judges, when I was preaching through judges, uh, it was hard to find evangelical commentaries on judges because a lot of them like would say the few that I looked at would say outright on the front end. Yeah. Like we don't really see Christ in, the book of judges yeah. <laughs> is too, too sour and dour yeah. and it's all horrible. And I was like, I wonder if a lot of evangelical commentaries and pastors kind of like skip over a lot of Jeremiah. Cause that's all exile language and judgment. They're like, how do we find good stuff? How do we find happy stuff? And yeah, the they, you preach at the very, yeah. You preach the first chapter, you know, the Lord, you know, you like, you yep. know, uh, like, like sanctity of life Sunday, you preach, <laughs> yeah. you preach chapter yeah. one. Yeah, about the Lord knowing Jeremiah in the womb. Yep, and mm-hmm. then you preach like uh, out of way, out of context for like you know nationally a prayer. Yep, Jeremiah, Jeremiah twenty nine. You know, I, I know the <laughs> thoughts I have for you, thoughts for good. You know, like and then the rest of the book people never even look at. You know, no, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's why it's, it's helpful hard. that we're doing this because it's combing <laughs> through every book of the Bible. Yeah, and having giving that reformed comb the desert. You ever seen that movie? <laughs> yeah. The Christological, pers- <laughs> you know, Christological reform perspective, you know, yeah. so, um, you know, the, the, uh, and also coming right off of Isaiah, which is just such a prophetic book looking at like details of Christ. Yeah. And then it's even though there's like 30 chapters in Isaiah, that's like almost pure judgment and gloom, yeah, kind of doom, over that doom, stuff. gloom. Yeah. And then we jump yeah. right back into Jeremiah mm-hmm. And, and like more of this judgment stuff after we just got out of this in Isaiah and you go into Ezekiel, it's like, oh my gosh, it gets even worse in, in Ezekiel. There's yeah. some language yeah. that like almost intensifies judgment throughout yeah. these prophetic books. No, we, we yeah. finished like, I don't know, it must've been last year. No, uh, yeah, you're in right now. Sorry. Uh, yeah, like I'm kind of like middle way through Ezekiel in our morning service uh, yeah. for Old Testament reading. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then like for a year and a half for that, or probably a year, I don't know. We did Jeremiah, so it was like, yep. yeah. When I was at Oceanside, like, oh my gosh, Jeremiah. man, Jeremiah, yeah. doom and gloom. And you go to Jeremiah, you go to Ezekiel, and you're like, oh, geez, here we go again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it did, like yeah. Ezekiel is, and we'll get to it. Ezekiel is like both doom and gloom, but it's also like really pointed. And yeah, but I would say like yeah, flowery I mean, language. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, Peter's been there, but I try to give like a. Little homily quick little snippets. summary yeah. of a passage when I read it, and like especially those, ju- those judgment passages, it's oh, just a yeah. great segue to talking to people, you know, for a minute or yeah. so, like who are not believers or who may not yeah. have been in church for a while. And you're like, hey, this judgment is pretty serious stuff, but you know, this is the God that, <laughs> yeah, 
reveals himself in the scripture. Like he's this is who he is. Like he's a God of mm-hmm. justice and righteousness. And yep. you know, yep. Uh, yep. it's just that's always a good segue to the gospel. So yeah. Well, well like yeah. like I was saying, Jeremiah is <clears throat> a really long book. But Lamentations is really short, so mm-hmm. it's okay that we put them both together. And there's a reason why, because they're both tied to Jeremiah, the, mm-hmm. the person. He wrote them um, both. Yeah. And so um, so I wanted to start off with just a explanation of what our uh, Jeremiah structure would be broken down. And th- based on the different sources, you know, I just pick and choose tiny ones from, you know, from these different resources, but all of them are pretty much agreeing on chapters one through 25 and then chapters 26 through 52. So just to, like cut it right in half. And so yep. chapters one through 25, a collection of the prophets, oracles, and prayers. And then chapters uh, 26 to 52, the biography, hope, and judgment on nations. So that Sounds would about be... right. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then Something like um... that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's more breakdowns you can have, but that's yeah. like the that's big, a simple... 30, foot overview. I haven't I didn't see any other ones saying something different. And sometimes I've seen variations of other ones. Everyone's sure. saying the same thing on that one. For lamentations is actually broken up more, even though there's only five chapters. Chapters one and two. Uh, the voices of Jerusalem, Zion. We'll get into this stuff. Uh, chapters three, chapter three, individual travail. Chapters uh, four and five, repeating the pain of Judah and Jerusalem's fall, and a plea to God to remember His people. Yeah. Um, so let's There's go. A, actually, with... kind of a fun structure with Jeremiah too, or with uh, Lamentations. Lamentations. I mean. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and Danny might know this too. It's Lamentations, what's called chiastic. So it's oh okay. Um, chapter one and chapter five like roughly deal with the same thing chapter two and four yep. roughly deal with the same thing and then chapter three is like the zenith of lamentations and I, I think especially so i think the middle of lamentations is lamentations 3 22 and 23 which tends to be everyone's favorite verses from yep. lamentations which is the hope yep. but it's like hope in the midst of all of this carnage um yeah. so yeah lamentations is like kind of colloquially uh chiastic which just means if you think of like a pyramid so it yep. starts off yep. somewhere and then ends off basically in that same place and that high points in the middle of lamentations i don't yeah. have it exactly memorized but i'm pretty sure uh yeah lamentations one two four five yep they're 20 they're 22 they, verses they mirror each other yeah yeah and they're like, they're acrostic poems so every, that's right that's right that's right in hebrew every verse begins with that le- the like Aleph, Bait, Gimel, Dot, like yep. A, B, C, like every verse, like begins with the first letter of the alphabet, second verse, second letter of the alphabet, twenty-two yep. letters, twenty-two verses. If people right? know, um, like Psalm one nineteen, Psalm one nineteen yep. follows yep. the same thing. It's acrostic, so it starts yep. with Aleph, which is the first letter of yep. the uh, of the um, Hebrew alphabet. Then it goes to Bait, then it goes to Gimel, then it goes all. So he there Psalm one nineteen. It's twenty. No, what is it? it's eight verses per alphabet letter yep and lamentations i forget what it is but i think yeah, each chapter begins the and first two chapters through. the last two chapters are 22 verses each and that's yeah, the it's that's acrostic right. but then chapter three is three times acrostic yep yeah so it kind of six stands six out verses. from the rest yep. of the yeah so, so it's, yeah it's the middle it's the middle lamentations is like the crying out chapter but it's also mm-hmm. such a structured chapter Yep. And if you follow, if people can read Hebrew, then you, if you follow the Hebrew, then it like it kind of gives you a central point right in the middle of Lamentations. Yep. Yeah. Basically, it's the the it's scroll. We, yeah, we describe both of these as actually you say books, but they're they're scrolls. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, comprised five uh, the Lamentations of five poems, grieving and protesting and praying over the uh, 587 BC disaster. Yeah. Um, and Lamentations, you know for you guys or not you guys but the audience <laughs> you guys already know this the um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh they're they're it's said to be part of the five scrolls so if you guys hear uh that uh, of the megaloth um song of songs ruth ecclesiastes and esther the other four yeah. but the lamentations in and jewish worship is used the most out of the, all the five scrolls for those yeah, um, and I, I if I remember this correctly, Danny, maybe you know this better than I do. It's like each book in this five scroll thing, that's the megalot, it's used for a specific festival, and I don't yep. remember which one the Lamentations is used for. I'm not sure. Yeah, but I know. Yeah, I can I can look it up. But yeah, each one is for a festival. So. Yeah, because I think Song of Songs is used for. 
think that's Day of Atonement. Um, Ruth is or uh, Esther is the Festival of Purim. Um, yeah, there's like they there's a fancy not fancy, but like yeah, this is this goes back historically in Jewish worship for how each of these books are used, and it goes a lot to its meaning, um, tying it to a specific Jewish festival. Yeah. Um, cool. So before we dive in and do uh, landmark Christological landmarks, you know, on certain chapters that I highlighted that you guys saw and you guys can um, bring up other ones, too, because, you know, this stuff better than me, you preach on it and stuff like that. So but if you guys and you guys can team up or just one of you take it all, whatever. Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, because it's a, it's it's a lot going on. So um but if somebody just doesn't know anything about the Bible and you're like, hey, what's what it what is you know a thirty thousand foot view summary? What's Jeremiah and Lamentations all about? Background, you know, who is he? What's going on? Context, you know, what's the point? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start this off and then yeah. Danny, you wanna yep. add to it or say, hey, Peter, that's really wrong. I'm gonna give you a better <laughs> idea of what this is. But yeah, Jeremiah, yeah, for somebody who doesn't know, it's um. The, or the temples built, the, the Jews were worshiping their temple, and then they are following into all sorts of sin, not following the law. And so the Babylonians, and then uh, the, the other tribe is, I think, Assyrians, um, both of them are taking them into exile. And so Jeremiah is is like talking and pleading to the people. It's like, hey, you're like, you're going to exile. This is really bad. Like, all this, all this judgment's coming upon you. And it's not because... Um, God forgot about you. It's not because God is kind of skipping ahead a little bit or God like has different expectations because you knew this, like what to follow the law, what that looks like. And you didn't follow the law. And therefore what I promised to happen to you in the book of Deuteronomy and in other books as well is happening to you right now. And so <clears throat> that's maybe like 30,000 yeah. foot view. It's yeah, they're the Israelites are northern and southern kingdoms. They're crying out to God saying, why are we in exile? We, all we've done ever done is follow you. And God is like, well, not really, because you know exactly what the law is. And I told you this is going to happen. Yep. And therefore you're in exile. So I'm using these pagan nations to judge you. And can I add okay. one more thing too? Uh, yeah, before Danny comes in. Uh, and we see a lot of this is like <clears throat> the, the drama person, maybe a.k.a kind of the bad guy is King Zedekiah is just an awful King. He's the mm -hmm. last of the Davidic Kings that really ruled in Judah. Um, and we see the fall of uh, the kingdom of Judah because he was conspiring against his ally, the kingdom of Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar, but he was going behind their back and, and uh, talking to Egypt to conspire against. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't exactly like Israel was like, no, don't do this. They're like, yeah, this sounds good. We'll, yeah, we'll continue and, with this. So like, they, they kind of joined forces. But uh, Zedekiah was allowing false worship of other gods in, 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 yeah. in his land. And so he was, he was kind of a weak King where he was wanting to appease the people rather than God. So Jeremiah was calling out to him like, you got to fix this stuff. You got to yeah. repent. He told him over and over, you got time to repent, but God used the kingdom of Babylon to, as his own wrath, to uh, dethrone Zedekiah, which is a tragic ending um, you'll get into. But um, that's the the fall of, uh, and then the, the temples burned down. Um, Babylon takes all their stuff, but um, God uses Babylon for his wrath, but he doesn't really, like, he's not excusing Babylon's evil or anything like that, but... I just wanted to point. I just wanted to highlight uh, King Zedekiah and then Danny. Go ahead and go. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say, but whatever. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, no, no. Make it a little longer. Yeah, I mean, yeah just the, the big flow of you know, uh, God. The Lord makes a covenant at Mount Sinai, Exodus twenty-four. People say all the Lord has spoken, we will do, and then that happens again. Uh, that's the first generation. It happens again in like uh, Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. Second generation says same thing um happens you know, again in joshua joshua it's like you know me and my house are gonna serve the lord um yeah and then you read like second like we talked about before we read the uh, the kings especially second well the, the first first kings and then the second kings the the kingdom splits after solomon dies um and uh the end you know it all ends up right with uh the king just kind of like chilling you know at mm -hmm. a table eating food 
<laughs> drinking wine, you know, Jehoiachin, hanging out, you know, in Babylon. Like, okay, uh, that's weird. Um, yeah. So Jeremiah is, you know, we got to go back into Second Kings and read those like ups yeah. and downs of the kings and the people and. Just like Jeremiah Isaiah, speaks. we have to read this with the kings. This yep. is not yeah. like a separate situation. Yep. And he sp- yeah, and as Nick said, like he spans a huge length of time. Um, so you know, many many kings, many you know, over over a generation. Um, yeah. So you know, you have his call at the beginning, then you have like this, basically just lament, lament, lament. You know, he denounces them constantly. There's little glimmers of hope here and there, mm-hmm. and then it ends just like Second Kings ends with the king chilling at a table, you know, this daily allowance of food and water or mm-hmm. wine. And you're like, this is really weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like Babylon did exactly what the Kings were, were supposed to do, which is like yep. take over the nations. And yep. now Israel becomes like the nations and is taken over. Yep. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. And it's yeah. like, it shouldn't surprise us that uh, like Lamentations to go into Lamentations, like that, it, that's one of the most used books in synagogue worship um, because you know, it's a, it's written, it's lament for uh, exiled people yep. who are outside of the land, who are, you know, apart from their temple. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, now, like that's how much more so is that true now, true. Um, you know, for for diaspora Jews who, mm-hmm. uh, you know, are all across the world and there's no temple. So, yeah, yep. it's a it's a lament. It's a crying out to God you know, for for his mercy to to remember them. Yep. Cool. Totally. Awesome. So now that the audience is like, OK, caught up to speed. Got a good idea what's going on. This is in the same waters and and uh, time and context kind of, uh, uh, you know, the last couple books we've talked about with Isaiah and mm-hmm. um, um, you, with the uh, yeah, second, these are first exilic and second prophets. Yeah. Yep. Sam, in, in the books of Samuel with uh, yep. Elijah and uh, Elisha and, you know, we're in that same time area. What's going on? We keep talking about the fall of Israel and, and Judah. So it's because um, it's because the Bible keeps on going back to it and like yeah, yep. plays it over and over and over and over again. And yep. they're like, there's another prophet, his perspective and his like what's going on, who he's calling out and not just talking about visions of the future uh, and interpreting dreams and things, but also telling the kings and the political and uh, religious authorities you know, hey, you guys are screwing up. You're you're worshiping God in the yeah. wrong way, or you're not worshiping them all, or you know, you're causing adult adult adultery versus God, um, that kind of stuff. So, landmark, first landmark, I want to talk about because I think it's the easiest for all, all episodes is like the chapter one to kick it off when we see uh, in this this book in Jeremiah's uh, when we see Jeremiah's calling, and like you said, Danny, um, this is a popular verse mm-hmm. because. Uh, he was called even within the womb of his mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was, he never knew a day apart from God, that kind of stuff. Which is different so, than Isaiah. Cause Isaiah was called into his life. And now Jeremiah is called before yeah. he actually begins his life. Yep. Okay. Yep. Can you guys give a little bit more like a Christological exegesis understanding of chapter <laughs> one? <laughs> yeah. That's uh maybe a quick little one. It's remember to, um, this is not too dissimilar from how Samson was called in Judges mm. 13 because okay. he's called before he's born. Um, or at least uh. he's a Nazarite in the womb from his mother, who's not made, who's not named. His, I think his father's name, but I don't think his mother is named. Uh, and then you get the same thing with Solomon. Um, you get the, and then obviously you get the same thing with Christ being called in the womb. You get the same thing with John the Baptist being called in the womb. So these prophetic, so it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's providing us like these little links between these prophets, between these people who are, who are supposed to, to lead either Israel out of exile or to show Israel, Hey, this is what the law demands this is what you have to do, or look to the Messiah to come and have faith in him. <clears throat> Cause it's like, it says in Jeremiah one, four to five, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And that's that's like temple cleansing language. A point to do as a prophet to the nation. So Jeremiah doesn't go to God with an application in his resume and say, God, I think I'd make a really good prophet. It's prophets are the ones who are called by Yahweh to proclaim his word. And then what's also kind of funny too is notice what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 1, 6 and who this reminds you of. It says... Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. 
which kind of sounds a little bit like Moses's. I can't speak because yep. I stutter. Yep. Yep. And so this is like it's prophet in the line of prophets. So it's that's he's being set up as a prophet of prophets, a prophet in the line of Moses. Yep. And yeah. it's pretty interesting that the Lord calls him to be a prophet to the nations. Yep. Um, yeah, that's true. Not necessarily yep. just to Israel. And then again in verse 10, um, the Lord says, I set you over nations and yep. kingdoms. Mm-hmm. And then the why to pluck up, to break down, destroy, overthrow, build and plant. And then he gives them like these little Im- these visions, this almond tree, yep. uh, or this almond branch. Um, uh, and then there's this boiling, this weird image of a boiling pot, but it's like, it's facing uh, from the north. So it's like a boiling yeah. pot, but it's kind of tipped over, it feels like, but because the Lord's going to bring judgment from the north. Yep. So it's like one of these weird images. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, it just, you know, as far as like the Christological stuff, well, yeah, I mean, obviously like the whole flow of the redemptive history up to this point and then where things are going, you know, it's, it's that story of the coming of the Messiah. Uh, these people have been disobedient. God's going to judge them. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously the Messiah is going to come one day, as we saw in, in Isaiah 52 and 53, the, the one who's going to come and take upon himself the judgment that they deserve uh, is going to come. But then I was just saying, you know, as well, like the fact that Jeremiah is a prophet to the nations, mm-hmm. um, you know, in, a, in that sense, Christ in his prophetic office, like he comes and he speaks yep. not just to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but yep. he also sends his disciples out to gather up the Gentiles. So, yep. And that also um, makes sense, too, because yep. in Jeremiah, the Israelites are amongst the nations at this point. They're exiles. So like they're, they're with the nation. So yep. Jeremiah, when he speaks to Israel, because of where Israel lies, he's also going to be speaking to the nations as well. Just yep. contextually and geographically, that's where he's at. Yep. Nice. So next, I want to <clears throat> drop down and talk about uh, chapter seven. There's a lot of temple focus. Oh, you got to get so- chapter four, too. Four is four is Go pretty good. Four is yeah. um Go for it. they use the same words as as Genesis one. It, mm. it talks about uh, Israel as it's um um tohu vavohu. It's formless and void. This is the oh, same yeah. language that Genesis one uses. Yeah, where's and that again? I can't. Remember. What verse is that? Jeremiah four. I forget the exact verses, but it's in Jeremiah four. I know that for a fact. But it, it speaks as Israel is like this kind of destroyed, decreated. Um, yep. Everything is gone. Everything is formless. Everything is void. So it's as if Yahweh has to recreate um, Israel from this rubble. He has to recreate the nations. All this stuff brings it back to creation language and also kind of to Noahic language because that's exactly what he does to um, the land in Genesis 6 and 7. He cleanses it. Oh, yeah, there it is. Verse 23. Um, yeah. Yep. Formless he destroys it. Yep. Formless and void. So it's like it's the same thing. It's it's He's repeating this. Um, I think the same wor- somewhat wording is cool. used um, in the Red Sea when um, when the Exodus comes out, where he's parting the waters, the formlessness and void of parting the waters. So again, this is that's it's all, like that's why you have to read some of these things sequentially and help us get to the temple in chapter seven. But this is helpful context: is is Israel is decreated. It's 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 kind of lost its telos. It's lost its purpose. It's lost its end. Yeah, and I think too like pointing for the new testament paul in romans six and eight i think maybe has some of this in the back of his mind because uh in romans six talks about we can't lose our salvation once justified and then romans eight it's uh that it's good god has given us warnings before it's too late mm-hmm. for us who are in christ we have comfort when the day of wrath comes yeah i don't know if he's exactly thinking of jeremiah four particularly he's just thinking of the prophets the theme in general yeah, yeah the yeah theme of judgments against yep. Yep. israel and the nations so you can think of all the prophets paul is like condensing them all yeah. and saying this is what they talked about and this has come but christ has come to take upon himself the judgment of both the nations and of israel on your behalf nice danny anything before chapter seven no i'm good sounds good man <laughs> oh, 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 oh. it's all good <laughs> So for uh, going back to uh, chapter, I don't know what you just said, but okay. <laughs> Tohu vavohu is the Hebrew of formless and void. It's, it's just cool oh, to see, like, it. yeah, okay. when you read the Bible and you remember things from, you know, one book to the other, it's just really cool. You see a lot of the oh, thematic yeah. continuity. That's, you know? that's what I was saying. Tohu, cool. to, tohu vavohu is Genesis one two. It's the formlessness and void of the yep. earth, and it's used again um, 
basically it's I think it's used again in Genesis six or seven um around Noah and now you get it again in Jeremiah four. So he's pulling a lot of the same themes. Oh well, yeah, nice. and like going back even going back to uh uh what is it, Deuteronomy oh gosh, I think it's in chapter four or so. Yeah. Uh or maybe it's seven. Somewhere in Deuteronomy early, uh in those early chapters, uh the Lord describes finding Israel like in the wilderness. Yep. Uh, you know, like a, like in a howling wilderness and God chose them. Yep. Right. And then he hovers over them. Yep. Um like a like a mother hen, you know, yep. a mother bird hovers. Yep over and then later on like in ezekiel it's the same stuff like the lord describes israel uh more graphic terms like basically a baby that was aborted and Mm -hmm. left to Mm -hmm. left to die you know in the wilderness but god found found that little baby and you know raised him so um yeah that language of like there's the creation is like like the decreation language or the the create the the language of like you know wilderness you know nothingless desolation formless void like the lord always describes saving israel as out of that mm-hmm. right yeah. and then recreating them but then they've mm-hmm. decreated that in their sins mm-hmm. and then god has recreated them again so yeah, yeah it's really cool yeah really cool. that's why you see this connection in jeremiah so judgment is not just judgment it's like yeah it's, it's like it's like being decreated it's it's like yep. losing your purpose losing your end losing the obedience all this stuff that that then tears you apart as it were from the inside and then yahweh comes in hovers over you like a mother hen and yep. then reforms you. He he gives you life. Born again. Yep. That's definitely pretty much. Language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So uh okay, third try. Chapter seven. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Temple language. Now I so think Jer- it's right to go to chapter seven. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So Jeremiah has a temple sermon. He has a couple, but uh Baruch, uh his uh sidekick guy. Yeah, Baruch is blessed. Yeah, he yep. does one of them. But inside the temple, uh, they uh, would worship God. But outside the temple, the people are committing adultery and worshiping other gods, including practicing child sacrifices. Yep. Uh, so God will destroy his own temple and allow Babylon to take Jerusalem and Judah over. That's part of prophecy. So Jeremiah's reaction to the false worship and use of the temple is similar to description to, of jesus when uh he sees the den of robbers in matthew 21 and mark 11 also and he John has holy yeah and he has holy anger and he flips over the tables and all that yep. stuff so z- focusing on jeremiah with temple stuff uh chapter seven what do you guys have to yeah well what's a little different especially with jesus is flipping over the tables is all this stuff happens inside the temple okay and at least with Israel, as far as I can tell in Jeremiah 7, I don't think this is happening inside, but since they're not cleansing themselves, and this is probably also the priest, this is probably everybody, they're coming in and and um and impurifying, they're they're decreating this temple. So they like they are they are um they're desecrating the temple because they do all this stuff outside and they come back inside. And I mean, welcome to the minor prophets, because the minor prophets just just destroy Israel over saying, You think by your cute worship in the temple that you're going to make me happy about what you guys are doing outside the temple. But I'm not just looking for worship in the temple. I'm looking for holistic worship for full obedience, mm-hmm. not just a, we'll do the right stuff in the temple because that turns God's favor toward us by doing the good things in the temple. And we can do whatever we want outside the temple, which I think he's, he's seeing this bifurcation that Israel like thinks they can curry God's favor like a vending machine and say, Hey, we'll do all this stuff in the temple, but outside the temple, we'll do whatever we want. And which is a little different, although there's some similarities with, with Jesus where they're in the outer courts and they're not actually like in the temple proper, but they're in the outer court selling stuff really close to Pentecost, which is or what really close to the day of atonement, which is not what they should be doing, but yeah, they're selling stuff, making profit and assuming that our little worship inside this temple makes up for all this stuff because that makes God happy instead of uh instead of actually doing the fullness of what he asks us to do which is not just sacrifice to the temple but uh a life of sacrifice both inside and outside the temple perfect yeah does Danny have any uh, thing to add on uh on chapter 7 of Jeremiah <laughs> I would if I was there <laughs> <laughs> Docs and duties over here. Um, yeah. Uh, this is like 
one of the, I mean, to me, it's like another famous phrase from the prophet Jeremiah. Oh, that, yeah. Yep. Uh, because they're, you know, he's calling them to repentance. Um, and, and they are, uh, they're, they're, they're doing all the right stuff outside, right? Like they're doing sacrifice and whatever. Yeah. Um, and they're doing it at the temple and the priesthood there and so forth. Uh, and they, but they're trusting, they're just trusting in the mere formality. Yep. Um, they're using the of, temple. Yeah. Of all that out outside stuff. Right. Um, and, and uh, they, the, the prophet says, you know, three times oh, yeah. that they are uh, trust, you know, saying that, you know, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, like, their trust was like, oh, we have, we got the temple. Like, we're good to go. Like, mm -hmm. as long as the temple's standing up, uh, you know, no, nothing's going to happen to us. Yeah. God loves us because the temple's standing up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it's like what the prophet Isaiah says in a different way. He says, you know, they, they, they draw near their lips, but their hearts are far. Yeah. So they have the out, outer, but they don't have the inner. And that's when Jesus applies that mm -hmm. to Matthew 15. Mm -hmm. Um when he says, you know, yeah, you, you draw near to your lips, but your hearts are far. Uh, you trust in the commandments and traditions of men, right? Uh, not the word of the Lord. So they weren't listening to God. They were just going through their emotions and doing what they had to do, but their hearts were far from the Lord. Yeah. So they think their um, rituals, they think their work, they think their sacrifices, they think they're like what they do makes God happy. That Like, oh, if, as long as we do this and we have the temple, all things will happen good in our lives. And yeah. again, that's why Jeremiah exists is like, yeah, this temple is about to get destroyed. And yeah. So yeah, because... the temple was like a, like a magical rabbit's foot hanging from their, uh, <laughs> yeah. from their rear mirror, you know? Yep. Yeah. Is there uh so the only other one in the first section um, that I could think of, if you guys have another chapter before chapter 26 would be chapter 13 talks about the linen loincloth, which is kind of interesting, symbolic language and jeremiah tells uh how to kind of like use it or apply it um do you guys have any like recap on chapter 13 with the loincloth the maybe Danny belt. does but I have, I have nothing uh do I, I just yeah, thought it was geez. interesting but we could brush over it if it's not no i have no thoughts on the <laughs> linen right. loincloth. yeah there's, there's some parts um, of jeremiah i was like yeah i don't know what that is how about I don't the audience remember that story Go ahead and read chapter 13. If you have any questions on it, you can ask us. So yeah. uh, let's go to chapter, actually chapters um, 21 and 22. He has a lot of yeah. criticism of the uh, Judas Kings. This is a good little um, touch point. Yep. Yeah. So let's talk about 21 and 22. And which, 23. Yeah. Okay, where Jeremiah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause Jer in 23, Jeremiah sees commitment to justice and righteousness as the central as central to projecting the ideal Davidic king. So there's a lot of king focus in yeah. 21 to 23 uh, with Jeremiah calling them out. And um, this point, yeah, he's focusing on Zedekiah, mm -hmm. the awful king. So where, what's your guys' take on, on this section? Well, yeah, he's, this is, I mean, this is the entire point of the prophets is they're, prophetic lawyers they're attorneys they're prosecuting attorneys and like then he has harped on and we have to keep harping on in the kings and the prophets is they are applying deuteronomy 17 to the kings and saying this is what it means to be a king so it means to be a righteous king a proper king and it's not even like the good guys are doing it the bad guys aren't doing it it's none of them are doing it and why aren't you guys doing it and you guys think you're going to be blessed by worshiping in the temple and you are not doing righteousness you are not doing justice yep. you are not committing yourself to the lord you are not writing down um tablets like danny talked about you're not copying the law and so he's saying yeah this is like you know the law you're like you think you can get out of it by your temple worship but you're not obeying the law mm -hmm. and they're just not like i mean zedekiah and the, and the authorities weren't repenting when they had time i mean we see that in Romans 2 and Galatians 6, that those who refuse Christ's salvation and mock God will see judgment played out in God's wrath. Well, so I, it's, I would even go further than that. It's not even just the refusing to repent. It's like they think they're okay. Like they they think, yeah. oh, be, like Danny said, because we have the temple, because we have all this stuff, we're good. Um, like making like making the law almost kind of easy to obtain. Like, yeah. oh, we can kind of do this stuff. They're missing yeah. the point. They're missing yeah. the point. Mm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And then in the contrast to all that, chapter 21 22 like that chapter 23 is really awesome just yep 
You oh know, yeah, like and that that verse, you know, about a righteous branch. Sometimes yep. again, like there you go. we can read that for like I don't know Christmas season and say, oh, it's a prophecy of Jesus. But then you miss like the chapters, the couple of chapters before that. That's like the lead up to that point. Yep. Like the they line don't of have David a righteous was, king. Yeah. Yeah, they were so unrighteous that, you know, it's like the foil, like the negative foil, the, le- the literary yep. like negative toward for the positive. That's going to come, the Messiah, who's who is going to be he says, deal wisely, execute justice, righteousness. Uh, in his days they'll be saved, dwell secure. His name is the Lord our righteousness, right? It's just like they're so unrighteous, like and again, like that verse, verse six of Jeremiah 23, like yeah, yeah we read that verse and like apply it to like the doctrine of justification, but like why? Yep. You know, yep. why? Yeah. Jesus it's, is the impulse is good to apply it, but yeah. we need, like you said, we need to get deep like behind it. So yeah, like the like the inherent as well as the active obedience of Christ yep. and, the, and the path of obedience too, but mostly in this context, it's the the fact that He is righteous. He does righteous deeds um, in the place of people who are just like completely, <laughs> completely a mess, you know. Um, and then even like the, the section that comes even after that, it's like then it goes back into the negative stuff again. It's like the prophets are just. The prophets suck too, you know. The king's yeah. lame, and the prophets are lame. The preachers yep. terrible. Like they, everyone's horrible. Everyone's horrible. It's as if what Paul said in <laughs> Romans three is right. It's there's no one right. righteous, no not one. Even their supposed good works are dirty yep. rags, and that's why he says this righteous branch who comes from the shoot of David. Um, again, who's David? That's a king, but also yep. David was not a great king for basically the latter half of his life. Um, but that's that's where you get this king language. We need not just a good king, we need a perfect and a righteous king who doesn't just tell us what to do, but can do it for us. Yep. And speaking of false prophets, uh, zeroing in on who uh, Hanani is the false prophet, you can see it really played out how a false prophet was appeared and uh, how he was was going... opposite of what jeremiah is saying he's yeah, saying false no, prophets almost never prophesied justice they almost always yeah. prophesy like comfort yeah he said he was going to break the yoke of nebuchadnezzar yeah. not 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 saying jeremiah agreeing with jeremiah to surrender to babylon but also i want to ask you guys is it too far off the mark you know looking at chapter 23 is it a good reminder of you know our reform covenant language of you know looking at the covenant of works can never be achieved by ourselves alone. The covenant works was achieved on our behalf by Christ and applied to us as the covenant of grace. Can we see that um, from chapter 23 of Jeremiah? Well, yeah, like, yes, you see, like Dennis, you see law language where, again, this is Deuteronomy 17 applied to the kings, and that's what Jeremiah is doing. It's like you're not being righteous, you're not being good, you're not being obedient and just and all this stuff. And they're they're kind of looking at the laws like this is something either somewhat achievable for us or because we have the uh because we have the temple system we can kind of do this on our own and they're like they're not actually treating the law as the law should be treated they're they're treating the law as like something we can do and curry god's favor like gain god's favor instead of seeing the law that it's one of its uses is, is showing us our sin and misery and then looking to the gospel promise genesis 3:15 and saying we're or the shoot of Jesse, the the branch of David, looking at that as the righteous king that we need to trust in. So like you maybe like the, the we can use the language of covenant works and covenant grace, but like you have to go further into like what's actually being talked about and how do we apply this to some of our reformed doctrines too. Yep. And then I guess just to go back with what I think it was Nick said. I mean it was I, I don't know. One of you guys just said I was like reading it <laughs> as you said it, like how the how the old testament prophets, how like lying prophets, false prophets typically speak comfort mm-hmm. is that you peter i can't remember that was Anyways. me yep yeah there you go uh good job uh, <laughs> uh it, well like a biblical mm-hmm. prophet like tells the truth right so yep. um and then yeah it's really interesting like the the prophet says don't listen to the people like he's saying don't listen to, the, to these to these prophets they prophesy uh they fill you with vain hopes mm-hmm. they speak visions from their own minds not from the mouth of the lord um and they and the uh they continue to they say, continue to those who despise the word of the Lord. It shall be well with you, uh, and so forth. Uh, no disaster shall come upon you. Um, it's so true. Like, in all my years as a Pentecostal, I'll just speak, <laughs> you know, applying this. Sure. When, during the, so in the church, the kind of church thing I came out of, like, there's always a time, like, 
at the tail end of the quote unquote worship time, the singing, um, where the lights were dimmed yep. and the music the flowed. Yep. And then the, we stopped singing, but the musicians kept playing, kind of strumming along, whatever. And then somebody or some people would stand up and give their word from the Lord, you oh, know, yeah. their prophecy, their word, you know, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, whatever you want to call it. Um, like in all my, in all my time, in all my years, I never once heard a negative prophecy. Uh, <laughs> like true. it was always like mm. someone who would stand up and say, you know, the Lord says, you know, I have, you know, I want to prosper you and I want to bless you. And, you know, I love you and you're my children and I care for you. Yeah. And, Sure, those are awesome things to hear and say, but I never heard anyone say like repent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, no rebuking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, back when I was in it, I never really thought, you know, much about this. But like later on, I was like, yeah, I never really heard any like real, like kind of like prophetic speech. Like, you know, we suck. Like, let's <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. let's stop, let's stop going through the motions. Let's, you know, it was always like positive sounding stuff, just like the prophet says here, like, don't listen to them. They feel this vain hope. They say there's no disaster going to come upon you. It's going to be well with you. Like, tickles it's their so ears. true. Like, just <laughs> like you need to discern what people say and like, why are people saying things? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a real prophet says that something bad is going to happen and the bad thing happens, you know, yeah. not just in generic terms. Like, you know, does somebody here have like a backache or whatever, you know, yeah. like, and then like all of a sudden miraculously, because they're all hyped up on, you know, on uh, emotion, their back feels better. And then it hurts yeah. again to get back in the car. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, pay attention to the words they're speaking. Like, it's, only, it's mm-hmm. always only positive. Mm-hmm. You know, you're like, I see these memes every week on, on social media, you know, from, from like word of faith preachers and people, people, you know, li- how, how many likes to get? I mean, tens of thousands, if not, you know, h- hundreds of thousands of likes and like, you know, where it's like, you know, God is going to bless you this week with a, you know, with, with a, with a windfall, whatever, you know, <laughs> you know, latter rain is coming, you know, all this, like, all this, like, biblical language to make it sound like, you know, and then how many people out there are actually getting, like, their windfall this week? Probably none. Yeah. I think it, know, too. it leaves you feeling frustrated, because imagine, yeah, if all of you hear yeah. is false prophecy, is like, oh, the only, the windfall, great the only one getting the windfall is Kenneth Copeland, though, with his, with his, yeah. with his private jet, that's, you know? Yeah. That's true, but your average Christian who's sitting in the pew who goes back home, it was like, well, am I not believing God enough for some of this stuff to come upon yeah. my life? Like my life is not very good. Maybe, yeah. maybe my, my, maybe my trust in God is not as strong as it should be. Well, they yeah. blame, yeah, they blame average Christians for not having enough faith to be prosperous. Um, yeah. I mean, the only one that has, has enough faith is, you know, the, the Kenneth Copeland, he has faith that people are such idiots. They're actually going to give them money, <laughs> you right. know, like that's, that's why right. he has jets and they don't. Like, yep. Yep. It's just, it's so cynical. Well, the, the big thing about Jeremiah, too, is he was just always speaking the truth and whether it was uncomfortable or not. Yep. I mean, it, sometimes the truth hurts and God's message yeah. is uncomfortable. And he was like, I'm just going to say the truth of what God's telling me. And if Zedekiah and the authorities don't like it, I, you know, that's yeah. their problem. The he wants to kill him because he tells the yep. truth. And yeah. This is- this you is not license for like preachers. Like I'm just a prophet. I'm going to tell them hard words and like, <laughs> take it or leave it. You're yeah. a, you're not getting your words from God. Like Jeremiah is where Jeremiah can legitimately speak the words of God. Cause he speaks inspired words and B he's not a jerk when he does it. He's just, he's telling them, this is what the law yeah. says, but one is coming trust in this one who's coming to <clears throat> what we'll talk about place this law in your hearts, not to condemn you, but to save you. So it's, yeah. yeah, don't, don't think you have carte blanche, um, right to just be a jerk with your words no. and just say, so, so this is not stuff. a justification for every preacher out there has to be preaching against, uh, the civil magistrate every single Sunday. This is not justification and posting it on social media. And yep. like, you know, I'm just being Joe a prophet. Biden, I'm looking right at you, Trump, you're in my target. <laughs> yeah. This is not justification <laughs> for us to, to do what Jeremiah did. This is. We are proclaiming the same, <laughs> yeah, we're proclaiming the same Messiah that Jeremiah did. Well, and Jeremiah yeah. was pleading with them to yep. take it. He's like, I want to see Zedekiah come to, uh, yep. you know, repentance and faith and and trust yep. God, just like Hezekiah did. Uh, he got warned and he turned he turned it around and God, you know, gave him grace. So um, that's actually a good tee up of, of chapters 27, 28. Uh, this is a, a popular part thing two that, of Jeremiah. Uh, yeah, I guess we are. Yeah. So I've, I'm looking at Jeremiah 27 and 28. Uh, he wore a, a yoke 
around his neck. Mm -hmm. And he used that as symbolism to kind of catch the audience, especially the authorities. Um, what, what did, uh, that visually represent, uh, that he was trying to express to the authorities of, of Judah, you know, this, they're going to, they're going to be slaves. They're going to be hauled off into slavery. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty pretty easy imagery. Yeah. That's their cows yoked to each other or yoked to the, the, the Lord doing whatever the Lord tells them to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Nebuchadnezzar, or I guess in today's world, Nebu, uh, uh, Nebu- uh, I, I had some funny I forgot it. <laughs> <Nebuchadnezzar>. <laughs> yeah. We even get this with um yeah, there you go. Nebu Giga Chad Nezer, you know. So. <laughs> oh yeah. You even get this with um with, uh Jesus' language in Matthew eleven. My my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So like he mm-hmm. flips this on its head, Jeremiah's yoke language. Because who's who's uh who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to the fr- the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, and those who think they're leading the people in the right way, but they're actually adding law on top of law on yep. top of law on top of law as yep. if it were your yoke. And then Christ says, well, my yoke is on a heavy one. My, my yoke actually like keeps you standing up. It doesn't, mm-hmm. it doesn't crush you. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Like Stephen in Act seven says that this is the yoke uh, burden that, they, that, they, that your fathers could never keep. Yep. Like they can never bear that burden. Yep. Right. The law. Mm-hmm. So that's what, yeah. And Jeremiah's talking about this. Yeah. That's you. I'm I'm symbolizing what you're actually under. Yeah. Cool. The next section, uh Get chapters... some good news here, man. Let's get some good news. 31. Oh, <laughs> like there it is. Here it is. Uh so chapters 30 to 33. We're gonna see uh covenant language. Yep. We're gonna uh and you know, you're gonna see reminder to Deuteronomy that was uh from Deuteronomy 30 that God will not completely abandon his people, he will transfer transform their hearts and renew the covenant with them. Uh, we see that repeated language in Matthew 28. Um, and then, so chapter 31, one of the best known passages in the Bible, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, talking about the new covenant, uh, a unique term to be brought up in the Old Testament. Talking about new covenant in the Old Testament, I will be their God and they will be my people. You commonly hear this today after, cited after a baptism. You know, and then so chapter 32 an everlasting covenant will overcome the effects of Israel's brokenness and sin in the old Testament. It was a way to understand the promise of grace and mercy. So what do you guys, this very important section here, what do you guys think? Yeah. Uh, I think, I think Danny's actually preached on this little oh, section cool. before. So I'm going to, if Danny, if you want to start off on yeah, where, where is Jeremiah 30 to 33 coming out and how does it help us understand this new covenant language? Um, I'm pretty sure I did preach on it, and I'm pretty sure that was a million years ago. Um, <laughs> so my, yeah, so like my, like I was taught by Meredith Klein, yep. and so this is a huge passage. So like, especially in our debates and our discussions with our, uh, with our friends, the Baptists, right? yep. this passage, <laughs> this passage yep. always comes up. So, um you know the language that we've or the the idea that we used before that the prophets were just they were just prophesying, you know, like all the stuff was going to come, but there there wasn't yet like that distinction between first and second advent, mm-hmm. first and coming. Um, so when they prophesied, sometimes they just all in one fell swoop. Yep, we mentioned this in Isaiah sixty one, like Jesus reads in the synagogue. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me to preach the good news to the poor, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And then Jesus ends the reading right at the end of that section because the ne- very next line in the prophet says that, you know, the day of the Lord's vengeance is yep. coming. Yep. So Jesus distinguished the first and second coming, whereas the prophets didn't didn't do that. Yeah, know? it's not like they didn't um, want to. It's just like they weren't yeah. quite able to distinguish these comings. So, yeah, like the further revelation has to come to like make better sense of like what really is going on. In the prophet. It's like a, so, maybe like an accordion, like if you scrunch an accordion together, you can't quite make the distinction out, but it's still a true accordion. And then when you yep. pull it out, you can start to say, OK, I now see the mountain range. I see what they're talking about, all this stuff. Yeah. And so like that language like that. So, you know, this this is like, like the, the days are coming like this is always like this is, you know, from the prophet's vantage point. Yeah, it's in the future, but it's more than just future. Like this is eschatological language. Like in the end, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and then we know from the New Testament, like, yeah, the new covenant has come. This chapter, mm-hmm. book of Hebrews quotes this passage extensively. The whole thing is quoted actually, uh, that the new covenant has come. 
uh, in the place of the old. But then there's that language about, you know, no one's going to teach his neighbor. They're all going to know the Lord and so forth. Yeah, because from the prophet's vantage point, like when the new covenant comes, everything happens. But we step back and say, okay, yeah, the new covenant is inaugurated. Mm-hmm. In one day, it's going to be consummated, yep. right? At the at the last day. Um, until then, the new the, the new covenant uh, is here, and but you know, in, and it has continuity with the old in terms of like children belonging and you know servants and slaves in the Old Testament or the whole household, like everybody in the sphere of of a professing Jew was part of that covenant, was part of that household, and that's still the case. Like you know, that that's the New Testament language, like the baptism of households, um, you know, and so forth. So. It's not about like, oh, well, there are infants in there. And how do you know there's infants? It never says that. It's not about that. It's about the household language comes right from Abraham. It's you, your sons, and everybody in your household, which would include servants, your family members, extended people, everybody. And that's why Paul talks about this. And Peter talks about this. Like households are baptized. Um, you know, even the even a, a child, of even just one believer is still holy. Mm-hmm. One Corinthians 7. Like that's Old Testament language. Yep. So anyways. Isaiah uh, Jeremiah 61 is like speaking of that final thing to come as if it's like all together, like all at once. Whereas we know, okay, we can read in Jeremiah 31 and we can see like, you know, it's inaugurated in the New Testament. But that verse 34 stuff is like, that's eschatological language. Like that's not going to be the case until eternity, until glory and new heavens and earth. When no one's going to know, you know, no one's going to need to teach their neighbor because they're all going to know the Lord. Yep. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. that'll be true when the when the covenant is consummated and there's yep. no more sheep and goats, no, no more uh, wheat and pears. Everybody, you know, in that sense is, you know, part of the, is the elect, you know, the covenant. So, yeah. And nice. I'll add something to that as well and point our listeners to Jeremiah 31, 32 and 33. It says it will not be like the covenants I made this, the new covenant he's talking about. It will not covenant. be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke yep. my covenants. Yep. No, I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, which is the entire point of the book of Jeremiah is like, this is exactly the covenant that you broke. And these are the curses yep. of the covenant, which is exile. Uh, and then 33, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. And notice this, and it's very easy to pass by this and not really feel the ramifications. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people in the midst of this, ju- like in the midst of this judgment. I mean, the law is not like, really great news for israel it's it's always like this is the thing that you broke this is where your condemnation comes from and when he says i will put him in your heart uh, you can imagine that like your average is really like kind of trembling a little inside as like oh it's going to get even closer to me this is this is gonna it's gonna hit me even harder it's gonna condemn me even further um but he's not saying the law which is like which is your condemnation it's it's this fulfilled law which shows you that you are righteous under this law that like this is the thing that has been fulfilled for you and a few chapters after this, you get somewhat similar language is Jeremiah 34. And if people remember way back when we talked about Genesis 15, this is episode number three. Uh, if you remember, what is the, what is the ceremony that Yahweh puts Abraham through to mm. show his covenants? This is, this is where he I mean, literally Israel. breaks the pieces in half. Yep. And yep. then, this flaming torch walks through and you get the same language at the end of after Jeremiah 33, where he talks about the new covenants. And this is Jeremiah 34 verse. This is Jeremiah 34 verse 18. Those are, I'll start with Jeremiah 34, 17. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You have not obeyed me. You have not proclaimed freedom to your own people. So now I proclaim freedom for you, which is pretty crazy declares the Lord, freedom to fall by the sword, plague and famine. I will make you abhorrent to all the king, kingdoms of the earth, those who have violated my commandments and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me. I will treat them like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. Yep. You get very similar language in this, which is he's talking about like kind of kingly treaties. Yep. This is fulfilling obligations because Jeremiah 31 is, is, is Yahweh fulfilling his promise to Abraham of I will I am the one who's who's obeying this this covenant on your behalf and then I'm going to apply it to your hearts. Yeah, that speaking of chapters uh we see in chapters 34 to 
45, the siege and destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. So I thought it was kind of reminded me how, you know, uh, uh, Jeremiah was captured and sent to Egypt kind of remind me of the Joseph story, but then also fast forward when we talk about Daniel, who's kind of a next prophet we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. He reminds me of the Joseph story when he's interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. So we're kind of seeing things like repeat. Mm -hmm. Exile. Yeah. They call it like recapitulation in the Bible. It's these stories parallel and kind of sound and look like each other because they're trying to make a point together. Mm. Trying to, trying to give you this through line, but yeah, which is, well, I'm sure we'll get into it too as we as we end this but i mean i mean just to be quite frank like look there's three chapters of new covenant language in the middle of 49 chapters of judgment and it sandwiches them so it's judgment bread judgment bread and then new covenant little meat right in the front of it or right in the middle of it uh and so it's it's promising you there's this yeah, there's this little hope that we're still looking forward to and speaking of repeating stuff, just the last thing to say about Jeremiah is it ends the in Jeremiah 52, it ends the exact same way Second Kings ends with Jehoiachin, the last hope, the last uh, would-be king of the Davidic line. He's released from prison from, I think it's Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, who's now the king of Babylon, and uh, and he allows him to be at the table uh eating and stuff and then we're going to fast forward to uh cyrus king of persia will take over babylon and so god will throw his wrath down on babylon and then the um uh the israelites will get their freedom from cyrus so uh that's fast forward to kind of things and then i know we're short on time so i'll just tee this up we already talked about limitations yeah. but what do you guys have to say about the any you know response to what I said, the very end of Jeremiah, and then anything else to add on Lamentations before we wrap up? Yeah, maybe I'll start again, Danny, if you want to add on top of this, icing on top of the cake. But you can see, yeah, Jeremiah, at least the the book, the prophet is judging Israel, and now he's lamenting over Israel in Lamentations. So it's like he's he's got to do the prophet's job. He's got to prosecute Israel under the law. But he's still part of Israel. Like this is this is still his temple, his people. Now he's lamenting that they're being judged, that rightfully so. But he's lamenting the judgment and the fall of the temple because now where do they go? Like what are they supposed to yep. do? Where's the where's yep. the sacrifice supposed to be? Agreed. Agreed. Nothing more to say. That it's good. <laughs> <laughs> but that's again. Think about it. With Jeremiah, you have. Basically, the first half and the second half are judgment pieces, and then you get this little mini sliver, as it were, of judgment or of a uh, promise in Jeremiah yep. thirty to thirty three, and you kind of get the same thing in Lamentations. You get laments in chapters one and two, essentially, and lament in chapters four and five, yep. and you get this little sliver right in the middle of Lamentations of this new covenant hope, this new this promise that right. one day the Messiah is going to come, and. Maybe if I can not critique, but slightly change next word, not just be the yeah, please the the weeping prophet over Israel, but actually take no. Israel's place yep. and be the one whom he weeps over. So he's he yeah. takes not just weeping over Israel, it's like, oh man, this sucks for Israel. But then he goes and takes Israel's place as the covenant breaker and says, I will die as the one that has broken this covenant. And God is the one who is smiting me, like we see in Isaiah 52 and 53, but he's doing this to take our place. So it's not just the one weeping over us. He's he's the prophet who takes your place. Yeah. I mean, the the authorities, too, uh, uh, really treated uh, Jeremiah very similar to how they are treating Jesus. And yeah, then Jesus, all the prophets are treated this way. Yeah. yeah Which is exactly yeah. why Jesus says, yeah, prophet's not honored in his own, home, yep. own hometown. Yeah. So I wanted to focus that too is like, and then Jesus was able to do what no man, including prophets could do is, you know, fulfill the covenant of works for us on our behalf. And yeah. And it's not like the covenant of grace is different than the covenant of works. The covenant of grace is just the covenant of works fulfilled. It's yep. just, you didn't fulfill it. It's the Messiah comes and fulfills the covenant of works and gives you all the benefits of the covenant of works in the covenant of grace. And all the covenant of grace requires is our belief. Because Christ is the one that was speaking to all these prophets in the yep. first place. 
Yeah. He is God's he is. word. So that whatever word. the prophets in the Old Testament are saying and uh, getting from God, that is Jesus Christ pre-incarnate telling them. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. Anything to add as we finish this episode, Danny? No, just, uh, you know, like you mentioned, like in Lament- Lamentations uh, in chapter three, the end of the first cycle of yep. uh, um, acrostic, it says, you know, the steadfast of the Lord never ceases. So yeah. yeah. The whole plea is based on, you know, that chesed, that uh, the, the Lord's, uh, his commitment to his own promise, right? His, his covenant faithfulness. So, yeah, that's the hope, right? And then it comes true. I mean, that, you know, yeah, where do you go? You're in exile. You have no temple. You, you you can't sacrifice. What do you do? Well, you know, you trust the Lord to restore. And even like we've said before, like even all the little mini like restorations and like the judges and the little respites they get of salvation. It's only ever like temporary until the, 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 until the Messiah comes. So. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, and this covenant faithfulness is not just I'm being faithful, it's I'm being faithful to the promise I gave to Abraham, even though it may not look like things are gonna go that well for you. It's I have promised this, and even yep. your unfaithfulness can't keep me from keeping my own promise because I am faithful to my promise, even though you're faithless and your promise to me. So it's he keeps it. He's like, Hey, you're gonna break it, but I'm gonna keep mine. So yeah. That's uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations. We we got through what fifty seven chapters in a in about <laughs> an hour. That's <laughs> that's quite a bit. But yeah, next week we finish Jeremiah and Lamentations this week, and next week everyone's got to look forward to Ezekiel. So oh yeah, if you think Jeremiah is bleak, just you wait until Ezekiel. Wait till the wait till the YouTube uh, all the YouTube uh, videos get commented by people who think there's UFOs out there in Ezekiel. You know. <laughs> that's right. spinning Eze- wheels man ancient ufos that's right yeah uh, ezekiel is has got some incredible language especially at the end yeah but he's he goes after israel in the beginning of ezekiel and also after the shepherds of israel in the in the middle of ezekiel so yeah that's the end of jeremiah lamentations this week looking forward to ezekiel next week if you guys want to find us you can find me at redeemer opc in Santa Maria, California. So the northern end of Santa Maria, meet at Temple Bethel. Um, so the big Jewish temple was destroyed, but this little temple is still there. And we might be moving sometime soon to another building, um, an EV free building of sorts, but that's cool. kind of still in the works. But we meet at 11 a.m. for Sunday service and 9.45 for Sunday school. So that's where they can find me. Danny, where can they find you? Oceanside United Reformed Church, O-U-R-C. And... Uh... We meet. We actually meet in Carlsbad, around right the border of Oceanside, uh, San Diego, North San Diego. Uh, Sundays we meet at ten. We have Sunday school at noon, and then we have night service at five. We have a lot of midweek stuff as well. So um, yeah, people can find me oceansideurc.org or just search me up or search up our church on social media. We're on all the different channels. Awesome. And then Nick, where can I find you? Yeah, I'd love to, again, I don't know why people would want to find me, but uh, I'll point them to the church. I'll put them to the church that uh, I've been a part of, a, a member at here in Southern California that's helped me out so much. Uh, love my pastor, love my church, uh, Trinity Orthodox Presbyterian Church in uh, Dana Point, uh, Capitol Beach, it's South Orange County. Um, yeah, I should check out that place if you're in Orange County. So yeah. Um, it's Palisades Elementary School meets at 9.30 a.m. Cool. So. All right. Well, we'll nice. see everybody next week for Prophet Ezekiel. Yep. All right. Bye. Good stuff.